I got a plate of chicken strips with that sauce on it, I'd be like, we've maxed Fuck. it out. This is fun. But no more. <laughs> well, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? For First Week Feast, I'm Sean Evans, and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we're joined by Kumail Nanjiani. You probably know him best from his Academy Award-nominated film, The Big Sick, or his role as Dinesh on HBO's Silicon Valley, now in its sixth and final season. He also stars alongside Dave Bautista and Stuber, which is set to theaters on July 12th. Kumail Nanjiani, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me, I guess. So I know that you're no stranger around spicy food. Is it still a dream of yours to have a show called Sweating in Restaurants with Kumail? <laughs> yeah, that was one of my family's idea because I love spicy food. But even if it's a little spicy, I start sweating. So my threshold is, is not crazy high, but even if I don't hit it, I start sweating. But I don't think it's gonna be fun for people to watch because it really is very unsettling. You're gonna find out. Okay, and I have said that I wanted a fork and knife because I've messed up with hot stuff before I don't want it in my eyes, so I'm not gonna touch it. Um, he knows what he's doing now. All right, so this, this will be fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's no big deal. deal. All right. Ah. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's delicious. I like the look in your eye. You have the look of someone who's like, you have no idea what's coming to you. Yeah. Well, I've seen it before. Yeah, you've seen it before. You have a confidence about you in this <laughs> that I find very unsettling. So during your appearance on Dak Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast, you said that you have a goal of putting on 20 pounds of muscle. Did you pick up any bodybuilding hacks from your Stuber co-star, Dave Batista? Oh yeah, he knows everything, mm -hmm. you know? You gotta eat six meals a day. He eats a lot. That's what I learned uh, working with him, is that he's constantly eating, you can't hang. Do you find that meathead stereotypes are sometimes unfair? Because I had a phase where I was in the weight room all the time, and I actually found myself really liking meatheads, because they're always down to spot you, you know? They're always, like, very <laughs> into what you're doing, you know? I will say, it is very refreshing to see huge dudes really talking about men's bodies. You know, they're, like, pointing at specific things, and they're, like, kind of touching you, and it's very, I feel very safe around them. Yeah, like, there's I, a certain community quality to it all. Right, I feel cared for, and they're very, very supportive. So, you know, this guy, one specific guy who's much bigger than me is always like, brother, I really respect people who work out hard in the gym, and I really respect you. So I was like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. It's cool. Sauce Bay, okay. So it's a big transition for a kid, say, from New York to go to a small liberal arts college in the Midwest, but I imagine the culture shock must have been very intense showing up in rural Iowa to go to Grinnell, fresh off the plane from Karachi and Pakistan. What was the best thing about living in Iowa, and then what was the worst thing about living in Iowa? Oh, wow, good question. Um, see, I'm already starting to sweat, and I'm not even feeling <laughs> And you're the close spice. to the eyes, which Do you made see me it? nervous. Yeah, made me yeah, nervous. Yeah, but I'm not touching it, so I'm fine. The best thing about living in Iowa was I'd come from like a very, very intense, like I came from Karachi, which is like, you know, like New York, it's 20 million people. Uh, you know, there weren't many Pakistani Indian people where I was, so I still felt like, I just felt a little bit special. So the best part of it was that it wasn't really populated. The worst part was that it wasn't really populated. By year three, you're like, all right, I need, <laughs> I need to go somewhere else. Loved Iowa, it was great, but at the end of the four years, very, very, very ready to move to a big city. And then of course you went to Chicago mm -hmm. and you were doing stand up at the Cubby Bear. I used to live a couple- What, really? You did? I used to live a couple blocks away from there. I live right by there too. What were the crowds like there? Cause that intersection could be kind of rowdy. Rough as fuck. Yeah, The I crowds were really, really tough at Cubby Bear. Um, I, wow, that's crazy. Cubby Bear, yeah, that's where I met a bunch of comedians for the first time. I think I might have met Pete Holmes there for the first time. Yeah, they had an open mic every week and there were these people there who were 
not there for the comedy. And then we were like, all right, we're gonna, great news. You're at a sports bar, you're all Cubs fans. We're gonna turn <laughs> right. off the game. And uh, Kamel's gonna now tell you how he feels awkward buying condoms at the store. And they were, it, it's a very tough crowd and they were okay uh, just being very vocal. <laughs> I actually want this. So we're in the sixth and final season of HBO's Silicon Valley. Obviously a lot to unpackage, but we want to start with, can you give us the origin story behind Rude Boys on the Lot? <laughs> Rude Boys on the Lot. I don't, I think it was season one or two. We're all just like nerds, you know? But we really were like cultivating this persona that we were like the bad boys. We would shoot at Sony, which is this huge, like a bunch of stuff shoots there. But we considered that we were like, we're the bad boys, everybody's scared of us. That was like the joke we did. And so then we got these jackets made for ourselves that said rude boys on the lot. And this company had gifted us these scooters. Now the scooters are everywhere that you can like, you know, yeah. get with your iPad. So we would wear our jackets that said rude boys on the lot. These really gaudy jackets. I think they had huge dice on them or something. And we would ride around in scooters. And then the security guard would be like, you can't do that. We'd be like, very sorry. And then one of the great scenes, not only in the history of the show, but maybe all of cable TV, is when you guys are debating the most efficient way to jerk off an auditorium full of 800 guys. Can you break down the mechanics of that scene and how the math was written for the jerk off algorithm? Apparently the math is all real and they got Stanford, like, uh, st uh, they got people from Stanford to like do the math. So when you're looking at the board and all the math is there, that's all real. Because we basically, they were like, what are the factors? If you did have to jerk <laughs> off every guy in this room quickly, what's the most efficient way? And it would have to be, you know, so it's two dicks here, two dicks here, and you're sort of jerking off four dicks at a time, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's more stuff, because then you're like, well, what's the math problem with it? Well, height, people's heights are different, so you can't have two dicks that don't align. But it's not that, it's actually the dick to floor length. It's not the height. And then there's how long someone's gonna last, right? And yeah. you have to do the hot swap on the way down, because you don't want to slow down. So like, if a guy comes, once I go up here, there's gotta be another guy with similar girth and dick to floor ratio. So there's a lot of things to consider. <laughs> um, yeah, that was my favorite scene to do. Other than that, the math is sound. And then- The math is totally sound. And then finally, uh, I'm sure through doing this show, you've been in contact with a fair number of startups and venture capitalists. Do you find that they're any more or less outrageous than the version that you portray on the show? They're worse. I mean, they had to keep like upping it. They actually took something from the show, from real life, that they had Gavin Belson, who's the bad guy on the show, and they had him say it pretty much word for word. And it was so unlikable that they had to rewrite it because it made the villain on the show too villainous, to repeat word for word what this real guy in real life said. It's funny because they watch our show and they're like, it's hilarious, everyone else here is like that. And we're like, you're like that too. So it's great they're so arrogant that they think we're not talking about them specifically, everybody else. It's perfect. I taste the pineapple. Okay, yeah. That's the first one that you start feeling. I'm, you're gonna see I'm gonna start sweating. Even though I am not in crisis yet, I will be in crisis, but I will look like I'm in crisis way before I am actually in crisis. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait, Kamel. I can. So, rappers and professional athletes are always posturing about who's the best gamer. Does that sort of rivalry exist in the comedy circuit? No, not many comics I know are actually into gaming. I'm one of the few people I know who's like really, really into it. And I am very good at it. And you know what? You can tout those credentials because a lot of people talk, but no one was back in 2011 breaking down the best video games of all time on G4. So you can talk that shit. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I was on G4 talking video games before, like, you know, video games became like super cool. I mean, they were cool then too, but, and I had a podcast called The Indoor Kids with my wife, Emily Gordon, and we would talk about video games every week. So my, my video game credentials are pretty legit. And then you've said that it's the only medium that's improved over the last 30 years. Can you unpackage that? I mean, you know, like movies, there are some movies from like the 40s, 50s, 60s that are always going to be among the best movies of all time. But video games, because of technology, are better than they have ever been. Like the actual products are getting better and better and more complicated and more narratively complex and satisfying and the game systems are getting better and the AI is getting better. So I really think it's the only medium we have that in terms of quality 
uh, is getting better literally every year. As an Academy Award nominated screenwriter, is there a game that you just have to tip your cap to from a writing perspective? When your buddy Pete Holmes was on the show, he had a lot of nice things to say about the character development in Red Dead Redemption. I think the Grand Theft Auto games are great because they hit this really like, the mark they hit is so narrow. They're, you know, they're like sort of satirical and heightened and really funny, but you still care about the characters. That's a very hard thing to do, to have like a satirical world where you really, really care about the story. Skyrim I thought was really interesting because the narrative is cool, but you sort of create your own narrative as well. That's the thing with fantasy worlds, you know, it's got to feel lived in, it's got to feel like there's a history. It can't feel like it started when the game started. And those games do a great job of that. Um, the, way you, the history of the world uh, that you're in is so fully fleshed out. Okay, is this when things get real? I think for a Spiceman like yourself, a Spiceman, thank mm -hmm. you. You have another one or two sauces before it gets a little hairy over here. Things got unbearable? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Kumail, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram, where we do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. So I'll bust out the laptop. I'll show you the picture. You just tell me the bigger story. Does that sound good? Uh-huh. Do you get scared each time you do? You're like, oh, I gotta do that again? Or do you like dread it each time? Because well, you know exactly what's coming. You know what I think happens is that the pressure of the interview, right? This is the first time that you and I have ever met and I have to help create this energy and create this connection with you, you know? And I think that that takes my mind off the sauces. So like these could all be this sauce and I probably wouldn't even notice. Oh, well, that one's bad, huh? It gets a little weird over here. <laughs> it gets a little weird. All right, what's the craziest thing that you saw at WrestleMania? Oh my God. Um, so we were front row for the match between Dave Batista and Triple H, because, you know, friends with Batista truly love them. I remember being there and the commentary tables were in front of us. So it was us, commentators, and then the tables. And I remember being like, wow, these, <sighs> Tables are shoddily made. The construction seems awful. And then Dave landed on one and like splattered it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's it why. all makes sense. You now. don't want like oak furniture. What was a more memorable nerd rite of passage for you? Chatting oh, out I know with what you're George talking R. about. George R. Martin or meeting Stan Lee? Wow. Okay. Okay. You know, love them both. Love Game of Thrones. I mean, Stan Lee has done so many things. And I remember I interviewed him. And we kind of, I kind of started making fun of Superman and he loved it. He thought it was like really fun and he started making fun of Superman with me. And I was like, that's awesome. I got to make fun of Superman with Stan Lee. And now, you know, obviously he's gone. So meeting Stan Lee was definitely extremely, extremely exciting. And he was just very warm. And I mean, look at him. He's got his arm around my shoulder. He's not doing the hover hand or anything. <laughs> One more for you. Yeah. Speaking of meeting your heroes, they say you should never meet your heroes. Yeah, they do say that. But I'm, I've been very fortunate in that the heroes I've met have all been wonderful. And that's uh, obviously David Duchovny and uh, Janine Anderson, Mulder and Scully. Um, yeah, it's my favorite show of all time. I used to do a podcast about it. There was a little time in my life where if I liked something, I would do a podcast about it. And then I realized that's terrible. Don't make stuff you love into work. Anyway. My favorite writer on the show, Darren Morgan, he was like, do you want to do this show? I said, yes, of course. I was really, really terrified. And that's the last day of shooting. I was like, once I'm done, I'll ask him for a picture. And the reason I'm smiling, laughing like that is because David Duchovny was uh, blowing in my ear just before it. All right. Well, the X-Files talk, it is a lovely segue to the next wing. Uh, what is this, Hellfire? Oh, you know what? When you eat a spicy thing, there's the spice and then there's another flavor, mm -hmm. impossible to describe. Sort of metallic. Something shows up. And that's the first time I feel that. <laughs> and I've never been able to articulate. There's something, there's like another ghost floating around in there. And he has just shown up. I'll do one more bite. There you go. That flavor. Fuck that flavor. I do like it though. <laughs> I like how it tastes. Right, same. There's something about the spicy that food. That thing that shows you. up, mm -hmm. that's like flitting around, that's like, hey, I'm gonna be here for a while. Make myself at home. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, by all accounts, you're one of the biggest X-File obsessives on the internet. As we talked about, you had that podcast where you deep dive individual episodes, and of course, recently you got to guest star in the series Revival. What's your take on the infamous Home episode? Oh, There's I, a lot of mythology around. I love that episode. That's one of my favorite episodes. Um, people remember it, obviously, as a very intense episode uh, because it's got some graphic violence in it. But it's also one of the best written ones. Um, as the world becomes more modern, it homogenizes. So all these like weird towns are disappearing because of the internet or because like corporations are moving there instead of weird restaurant. Now it's Applebee's. And this episode really is about one of those weird little towns pushing back against encroaching modern civilization. Um, so I think it's uh... I want to talk about this episode for a long time so I can put off what's coming next. And then I know when you were doing the podcast, one of the ways that you'd prepare for it is by combing old message boards so you could see what fans were saying about the episodes when they actually aired. Yeah. In doing that, did you see a difference in internet discourse in the mid 90s versus today? So the X-Files was started in 93. It was really the first show that had a following on the internet, right? People were very respectful to each other and the conversations were very smart. And I would see it only took a couple years as internet was spreading. I saw the first like AFK away from keyboard show up. I saw the first like emoji show up, which was like, you know, the smiley face, which is the, the colon with the parentheses first show up. And I saw it turn from being like a lovely place of discourse to you're a fucking idiot. Right. And it happened so quickly. But I saw that happen through people talking about X-Files episodes. It was awesome. So for me, this is probably the ceiling of what I would eat and consider enjoyable. Like I would eat, I would, if I got a plate of chicken strips with that sauce on it, I'd be like, we've maxed oh, it out. This is fun, but no more. <laughs> well, one, two, three, four. <laughs> At this point, I want to know I'm eating a big enough bite that people at home aren't thinking that I'm not doing the thing. Is that is that enough or more? That's plenty. That's plenty? <laughs> <laughs> so you've worked alongside directors with some of the biggest cult followings in Hollywood, from Jordan Peele to Judd Apatow to Mike Judge. And then I know that they're all unique in their own ways, but do you see a character trait that runs through all of them? Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. See? You're not the only one who's making you things have. hard here. <laughs> I can make things difficult too. Yes, there is a character trait in common. Next question. Um, I, I think that they're all, other than being obviously very smart and good at what they do. Am I sweating a lot? A little bit, but you know what? Come on, I've seen some crazy things what have from you this seen? side. Laps, people spitting in buckets, screaming, pacing around, bailing to take a break for a little bit. I've seen it all. Is that okay? Uh, there's no rules here, you know. Okay. Yeah, I could tell. <laughs> this is the fucking Wild West over here. Oh, God. Ready? There's a picture of a nuclear bomb on it. This one has that extra special something, because I will say that the first time the ghost showed up was here. Mm -hmm. And then this one, you know what? Like, for instance, in terms of spices, I'll bring it back to video games. I remember when we went from like NES to Super Nintendo, that was a big leap. And then PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3 wasn't so big, or PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4 wasn't so big. This feels like a Super Nintendo to a PlayStation show. Like, we're in the fucking big leagues now, motherfuckers. For real. This is real. So I understand that your nickname at one point was Kumal Biryani. Can you explain biryani to the people who are watching right now? Why, uh, in your opinion, is it one of the great dishes of all time? There's a show on Netflix called Chef's Table, and there's an episode 
I'm gonna get fucking get through this. There's an episode about Asma Khan who has a restaurant in London, and uh, there's like a 40 second thing where she's making the biryani, and she opens it and she pulls it out, and I cried. I it looks so good that I cried because I know that feeling of being at my grandmother's house and you know the biryani is there but you don't smell it because it's been sealed. When she opens it and you smell it and she all the colors of the rice and the meat come out and um, and I just started crying. Is there a Pakistani dish that's hard to find in the US that you think could really flourish as a mainstream menu item? Uh, I would say that kebab roll, kati roll, could be on every corner and I think it's like a good entry point for most people. I have to blow my nose. Do people do this? Mm -hmm. Everyone close your eyes. Pause the cameras. Oh God. Oh. I think it's really gross. Hold on, I have to look at my phone and see how my face looks. I have to turn my phone on. We could talk. Movie star shit. Yeah, movie star shit. I've never felt less like a movie star in my life. And I've never felt like a movie star, but I've never felt less like one. I admire your fucking drive, man. You know what sucks about these guys? Yeah, yeah, tell me. They, in the beginning, they're like, I'm not so bad, I'm fine. It's like a house guest. And then like a few minutes later, they're like shitting on your couch. <laughs> like they don't, they don't announce themselves as being horrible. It's just right when you're like, oh, this is gonna go fine. Like right now. Uh, did you find that you were lulled into a false sense of security? Or did you kind of see this coming around the bend? The I time? knew it, they were all gonna be horrible, but like this <laughs> one and the one before it, the immediate sensation isn't, oh wow, that was really intense. It really builds. Which was a bigger accomplishment for you, being named one of Time's 100 Most Influential or getting name-checked in a Jeopardy clue? Time's Most Influential one was funny because people were upset that Putin wasn't on it. And they were like, Kumail's on it, but Putin's not on it? And I'm like, I guess the Jeopardy one is better because my parents were very impressed. They were very excited about Jeopardy, the what Jeopardy. Wow! Speaking of your parents being proud, was your dad, who I understand is a jeans aficionado, proud to see you on GQ's Best Dressed Man of the Year Am I supposed poll? to ignore what's going on? <laughs> this is the last dab. We call it the last dab because it's tradition around here to put a little extra on the last wing. You don't have to. No, you, you do it on to. mine. I'm not gonna do it on mine. I, I got you, Kamel. There you go. What's going on? Hold on. Let me see. Make sure my face is okay before we do this last. Hold on. Gotta check it. Wow. I look like I'm currently being waterboarded. <laughs> I, I think you look great. I think you look great. Wow. Let's take a picture of you. Good, good pose. <laughs> wow. I really... Okay, here we go. Here we go. <sighs> Classic dab. Classic dab, cutting off a corner. So, all right, here we are at the final stage of Hot Ones, the final boss. We've talked a lot about your nerd cred, which spans <sighs> from the X-Files all the way to <laughs> gaming and everything in between. But one thing that we haven't hit on is your love for old school cartoons. So here I'm gonna hit you with a Wing 10 pop quiz about one of your more niche off-piece obsessions, and that is He-Man. So if you can drill three He-Man pub trivia questions under these circumstances, I think the internet will be very impressed, oh, okay? God. First question. <sighs> True or false, the He-Man action figures actually predate the comic books and cartoon series. Um, yes, correct. That is true. Yeah, they made them and then they made the cartoon as like a advertising. Who voiced He Man in the 1987 film oh. Masters of the Universe? Was it Howie Long, Bruce Willis, or Dolph Lundgren? Dolph Lundgren. It is Dolph Lundgren. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. What color is Evil Lynn's hair? It's black. Or is it dark blue? 
Or is it white? The cap is black. Her hair is white? Her hair is white. Her hair is white. But you know what, Kumail? What? Seriously? Look it up. Go ahead. Hold on. Two out of three on the He-Man pop quiz. Nothing to sneeze at. That? White hair. White hair. That Evil Lynn, is, white hair. I don't know It's certainly that. not black. It's certainly not no, black. But look, I've, nobody's ever seen that. How did you find blue. that? Now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet Even for you, my friend. Even then, cause This camera. This camera. This uh, camera. Uh, Let the people know what you have going on in your life. There's one little picture I can find where she has white hair, and I don't know if that's canon. All right. Stuber comes out in theaters July 12th. Me, Dave Batista, Betty Gilpin, Natalie Morales, Mira Sorvino, Ico Oase, who's an amazing action star. Uh, go see this movie. Just flashback to um, my dead great grandmother's funeral, so thank you for that. Hey, what's going on, Hot Ones fans? This is Sean Evans checking in to say thank you so much for watching today's episode. But I have a stern warning for those of you out there who've been watching us now for nine seasons and have still not subscribed. This is your final warning subscribe or else.